Tonight we have a mix of horror stories involving parties, nightclubs, and people getting up to no good. Almost all of them will make you think twice before you drink too much around strangers. Before we begin, if you think you might fall asleep, please introduce yourself in the comments, and while you're there, please like the video and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm always interested in knowing what country everyone is from, so let us know in the comments and share what time it is where you are. Thank you once more for joining me. Get cozy, grab a glass of water, turn the lights off, and make sure you've locked your door. Don't forget to say hello in the comments. It's time to close your eyes. A few years back, I worked part-time covering as a karaoke host at a local bar. I've had a few run-ins with drunken idiots, but this one was by far the scariest. I'd only been working there about three weeks at this point. Prior to me it had been three different girls hosting, so I was the first guy. While training they warned me if I ever felt uncomfortable to call for security. I immediately took that as guys getting too handsy with the girls, so I figured I wouldn't have any issues since I was the first guy here. I quickly learned that the difference for me would be that people tend to get more aggressive with a guy than with a girl. So it was a Saturday night and I was hosting. It was about 1am and almost everyone in the bar was drunk and karaoke had been going pretty smoothly. So I call someone up and he says he wants to sing Zombie by the Cranberries. Problem is, someone sang it like 40 minutes earlier and one of the few rules we have is no repeat songs. He immediately starts ignoring me telling him this and just keeps repeating that he wants to sing that song. Finally, I get his attention and explain to him that he can't, it just isn't happening. He immediately steps to within about 6 inches of me and says, you're gonna let me sing that effing song. He then turns away and starts talking into the mic. I tell him one more time, either you sing something else or you don't sing. He then tells me to kill myself and starts ranting about it into the microphone. He was a weird guy, he looked like he'd been crying and he was quite drunk. So now I'm actually mad. I turn his mic all the way down, turn mine all the way up, and call for security. One of the bartenders immediately starts coming towards the stage and the guy turns to get in my face again. Now, this is where it gets kind of silly. I'm like 5 feet 11 inches and 160 pounds, not a huge guy by any stretch of the imagination. The guy giving me shit is a good 3 inches taller than me and about the same build. The bartender on the other hand is about 6 feet 2 inches and 230 pounds with a massive beard and does kickboxing for fun. He's jacked and scary. He gets in the guy's face and the guy immediately steps back and starts talking about how he's so self-conscious about his singing and it's the only song he loves but he understands the rules and just misunderstood me. It was kind of funny how quickly he backed down. He asked me one more time to let him sing that song and told me it was his girlfriend's favorite. I told him we just can't do it, but I'd let him choose another song. He took some time before finally choosing Rage Against the Machine. The one that explicitly says, I won't do what you tell me. As the bartender is walking away, the drunk guy says into the microphone, this song is about fighting against tyrants. My coworker immediately does a 180 and gets about 5 feet away from him and says, if the next words out of your mouth are words to that song, I'm going to throw you out. Something in him snapped at this point. He picked up the microphone, looked me right in the eyes and said, I'm going to sing that song tonight. The bartender immediately grabbed him and threw him out of the club. He came back over to me and apologized, but I wasn't bothered at all. I honestly thought the guy would just sing along to the second song choice. The lyrics are literally, F you, I won't do what you tell me. It would have been more entertaining. We never really had too many issues at this club, so security wasn't exactly tight. The night went on, a few more groups came up to sing different songs, and I'd completely forgotten about the emotional drunk. It must have been about an hour later when suddenly I see a bit of commotion at the entrance. The bartender is blocking someone's path and clearly gesturing for them to leave. I obviously couldn't hear what was being said but I could see that he was getting physical with someone. That's when things took a turn. 
The sound was unmistakable. I saw the bartender fall down onto the floor almost immediately and people around him started panicking. As he fell, I saw the man he was arguing with. It was the emotional drunk guy from earlier. I was positioned in a cramped little hut with a DJ deck and the only way out was the doorway directly facing him, so I just crouched down and tried peeking through a gap. I watched in terror as he walked straight towards me. He aimed the gun directly at my face and with tears in his eyes, he demanded I play zombie by the cranberries. I started to talk, about to beg for my life, when he interrupted and said, I don't care about this stupid rule. Like he thought I was going to mention the repeated song rule with a gun pointed at me. Please. Just do it. I have nothing against you. I agreed to his request and told him I was finding the song. He grabbed the microphone and got into position in the middle of the dance floor. I pressed play and he immediately closed his eyes and looked up, patiently waiting for the intro of the song to end. He starts singing and I hate to say it, but he was pretty good. He was putting raw emotion into his singing. He was using his arms a lot to gesture, which meant that the gun was pointing all over and I was constantly flinching. Practically everybody had ran out of the club at this point and I was still trapped in my stupid DJ hut. I think I was too scared to move, but also completely struck by the bizarre experience. As the lyric portion of the song came to an end, he started to look around. I felt a flush go through my whole body as I realized what was about to happen. He looked down at the gun, then towards the bartender on the floor, then back at me. I'm so sorry. His first shot missed me, as far as I could tell. I immediately started to sprint out of my hut. I had a million thoughts racing through my head as I anticipated his next shot in my back. I'd heard stories about people not realizing they'd been shot because of the adrenaline. I was convinced I was bleeding out and about to collapse. I was running so fast, wondering why I wasn't dead yet. I jumped over the bartender's dead body and made it out of the front door. The crowd screamed when I burst out and I had cops pointing their guns at me ordering me to get down. I was alive. But why? After the cops clarified who I was, they pushed in and went to clear the club. It turns out he didn't shoot at me. He shot himself. Straight in the head. Looking back, I think I understand his apology now. He never wanted to kill the bartender. He just wanted to sing that song one last time, and he was the one person in his way. Over the next few weeks we learned more about this guy. His girlfriend had just died, and it broke him. They were apparently regulars at the club, and that was their favorite song. I'm not sure if he'd plan on killing himself that night, or if the confrontation led him to think it was a good idea, but the whole thing was so messed up. The club shut down after that incident, nobody wanted to go there anymore, and rumors started that the place was haunted. I moved on to other things and try not to think about it too much. It gave me a new appreciation for life, even if that song gives me panic attacks. I'll start by saying I'm a 21-year-old female university student who lives in a small town in Greece. It's a safe town full of young adults, and I live in a safe area. I've never felt in danger before until that Saturday. Two weeks ago, I was at a birthday get-together at a restaurant with lots of friends and uni classmates. We were mostly drinking wine, and it was enough to get me tipsy, as I hadn't eaten anything before I came out. After we had dinner and drank, everyone started to leave, and a smaller group of us decided to continue the birthday party and go bar hopping. There were a few of us, the guy who was a designated driver, who was a 21-year-old male, and three more girls aged 20 to 21 years old. We went to some bars to dance and ended up in a typical nightclub, all of us tipsy at this point, including the designated driver. But I was the worst of them, getting really dizzy after having more and stronger drinks. After dancing for a couple of hours, the drunken feeling only got worse, so I decided to go home. I told the group that I was leaving, and they suggested walking with me. 
But my house is half an hour away from where the club was, and I didn't want to make anyone walk all the way there and back. Anyway, the designated driver didn't seem well enough to drive. I could feel that I wasn't exactly walking straight, but I had a sense of my surroundings and knew this road like the back of my hand. It was about 3 in the morning, so there were still people outside returning from bars themselves. I was around 15 minutes away from my house, walking past the takeaway place that was open 24-7 when I heard a guy yell. Hey, sweetheart, don't go. I just want to talk. Since I was the only female walking on this road at this hour, I realized he must have been talking to me. I tried to take a quick look behind me and saw a tall guy in an Adidas tracksuit with a hood over his head. He was walking quickly towards me. I felt an adrenaline rush and began to walk fast. I tried to get past my drunken state and think clearly. My house was in a dark area and I had to walk through a dark corner behind a grocery store to get there. I'm a sucker for true crime and horror movies and this felt like a real horror story coming to life. I heard him yelling at me one more time. He was saying that he only wanted to talk, but I had no intentions of stopping. I took my cell phone out of my jacket and pretended to be on the phone, hoping this would sway him off. Five to ten minutes later, I stopped hearing footsteps, so I put my phone back in my pocket and let down my guard. I assumed he probably got bored and left. As I was walking, I suddenly heard his voice again, and this time he wasn't far behind me. He was walking right next to me. I felt cold sweat all over my body. Why are you running away? He asked. You're so beautiful. I just wanted to talk to you. He had a thick African accent. We'd been warned by the university about people that had recently illegally come across the border. I said nothing and started to walk faster. He seemed around my age and had a cigarette hanging from his mouth. Do you have a boyfriend? He asked. Yes, sorry. I thought that if I lied and said I was dating someone, he would stop harassing me and go away. That sucks, he said. He must be a lucky guy. Can I have your number? I'd love to be with you. No thanks, I replied. This is creeping me out, honestly. He started laughing. I won't hurt you. I am very friendly. He stretched his hand out to me to shake my hand. I reluctantly shook it and immediately knew I'd made a mistake. He pulled me in and started to hug me. He was telling me I smell so good and I am so beautiful. I tried to pull away but he was really strong and I was still pretty drunk. He announced to me that he will make a very good boyfriend and he will come home with me. I was in complete panic but I knew I had to say something to get him off me. He was holding me tight for minutes, his hands were exploring my body and I was regretting every decision that led me here. I told him I was cold and we should go to my house. He let go of me and excitedly agreed. I was only five minutes away from where my roommate was sleeping. I had completely sobered up at this point and was thinking about every option in the detail. I decided to run. I was so lucky to be wearing my flat shoes and not my heels, which I usually wore every night. I ran so fast, not even looking back. I heard him shouting, but I couldn't understand him. I turned a corner and he'd lost me. I kept running the whole five minutes back, I wasn't taking any risks. I got home and immediately locked the door behind me and just collapsed, completely exhausted. I started crying and just wept against the front door for a good few minutes. My friend came downstairs and found me, and I explained what had happened. Nothing came of it afterwards and I stupidly didn't call the police, but we did make sure that our designated driver in the future wasn't allowed to drink. This happened to me just last year. I'd recently turned 18 and could finally go to a club legally. I'd used fake ID at bars before, but never actually been out to a club. I'm in the UK, where 18 is the legal drinking age. Anyway, 
It was me and five friends and we had one older guy with us who was 20, so we trusted him to lead the way and show us the ropes. We went from bar to bar, drinking as much as we could, and eventually ended up in a proper nightclub. I've always been quite a sociable guy, and when I've had a few drinks, I get really chatty and friendly. This group of lads were dancing next to us and one of them kept bumping into me. I didn't think he was doing it on purpose so I tapped him on the shoulder and tried making conversation. I politely told him that he was bumping into me pretty hard and joked that he nearly spilled my drink. I thought I was making friendly banter, but I guess he thought otherwise. He punched me in the nose and I blacked out for a second. I stumbled back and suddenly they're all having a brawl. I didn't throw any punches and just tried to help my friends and pull everyone apart. Suddenly, I'm grabbed from behind by a massive bouncer, or whatever you call them in America, doorman. He pulls me by the collar and throws me outside and tells me to go home. Within a few seconds, the rest of the bouncers throw out a few more guys, and I realize I'm in big trouble. None of them were my friends. It was just the group of lads that had attacked us. I tried to reason with the bouncers that I wasn't with them and that they were gonna mess me up. But they just pushed me away and swore at me. I turned to look at them and they made it a few meters down the road. I think I'm safe, but then one of them turns around and spots me. I wasn't taking any chances. I just started sprinting. I ran like an absolute mad lad, my heart was bulging through my chest and my pulse was echoing through my skull. They were chasing me and I could hear them shouting, but I've always been pretty athletic so I outran them without a problem. My nose had been bleeding this whole time and my new shirt was drenched in blood. I made my way into another club and messaged my mates about what had happened. They didn't reply for about 40 minutes and told me they didn't even realize I'd been kicked out. Didn't hang out with them much after that. Arriving at prison, I remember the process clearly. We got off the bus and were herded into a reception area called Block 16. Whilst there, they made us strip down, a bunch of us standing but naked, while the officers did their checks. It was no-nonsense stuff. After that, you approach the desk for fingerprinting and processing. It was there, you'd make a crucial decision. Some guys, like this one I saw, they'd come up to the desk, look the officer dead in the eye, and say something like, I don't think I'll make it in general population. At that point, the officer would ring a bell, and they'd be moved somewhere else, away from the regular crowd. But if you stayed quiet, like most did, you'd be led to a cell with a cage attached. In that cage, you'd sit for hours, sometimes the whole day, as they sorted you out. I remember the bell ringing often, people freaking out and rushing to the desk to ring the bell, only to end up in a smaller, darker cell out of earshot from the rest of us. It was scorching that day, probably over a hundred degrees outside, and you're just cramped inside that cell. Lunchtime came, and we got sandwiches. I'll admit, the food was better than the county's cheap stuff. I recall one meal particularly, chicken enchiladas with green sauce. It tasted real, like something that might actually fatten you up. There were some wild characters in there, no doubt about it. They knew there was a white guy among us, they'd seen him on the bus. This guy named Reggie, he didn't have any weapon. We'd just come on transport, but he was busy sharpening a pencil like a man on a mission. He took his sweet time, and when he was good and ready, he jammed that pencil right into the neck of another guy. It was the first day in reception and he just went at it, puncturing holes in the other guy's neck, and that guy went down fast. I was there, watching it all, thinking this trip was going to be one heck of a ride. In those cramped cages, we'd munch on our sandwiches, the stifling heat suffocating us. It had to be a scorching 110 degrees, at least. Finally, they'd come to move you from that holding cell to your assigned one. That's when it got real. You'd be alone in that cell for ten long days. No contact with anyone. Reception was like a test. They needed to figure out who you were and where you belonged. Everyone always asks about the first day in prison and this was the reality. The real deal, right there in reception. 
You'd roll in, be herded into that cramped cell with a bunch of strangers until they processed you, and then you'd be placed in your solitary cell, waiting for your fate to be decided. During my two weeks in that cell, I noticed some graffiti on the wall. Someone had drawn SpongeBob SquarePants and scribbled the lines of the theme song. It made you think about the kind of people you were about to join. Two weeks of isolation with a norm. I had to be patient until they figured out my custody level, who I was, and where I was headed. Meanwhile, I thought about the simple things, like how that sandwich I had in reception was a rare taste of normalcy. Block 17 is within walking distance of reception and this block was a constant source of trouble. I end up with this standalone skinhead as my cellmate. He claims to be a skinhead but isn't officially affiliated, he just labels himself. And let me tell you, we had our fair share of issues. This guy used to be a massive dude, easily tipping the scales at 260 pounds, but he lost a ton of weight, way too fast, leaving him with all this saggy extra skin. Initially, he seemed alright, but then he ended up in debt with the wrong people and started acting out. Him being in debt was bad for me, because the trouble would come to my cell, and I didn't want that. Every time food came around, I'd wolf down as much as I wanted, even if it was his. That's where the real problems began. He got all worked up because of some peanut butter. I wanted that peanut butter all to myself, and I made it clear to him, saying, Hey, buddy, none of this is for you. It's mine. Get lost. Well, he didn't take too kindly to that. From there our tensions boiled over, and I can't even remember how it escalated but we started throwing punches. Then, this overweight fellow managed to get me in some sort of guillotine chokehold, shoving my neck down while applying pressure to the back of my head. I was furious. I yelled, I'm going to murder you when you release me, fatty. My neighbor, Scooby, heard the commotion through the vent. He hollered over, asking if everything was alright. I replied, telling him, Mike's got his fat titties choking me out. The moment he frees me, I'm going to lay a beating on his fat ass. Mike finally started easing up on my neck, cautioning me not to do anything stupid. I snapped back, nah, the second he lets go, I'm unleashing hell on this bitch. Eventually, he released me, and, as expected, I swung at him, landing a few solid hits. He sat there afterward, sporting a bloody nose and a swollen lip, asking if everything was settled. I told him he was a punk, and yes, it was settled. Then there's this other incident. I'm just minding my own business when one of the higher-ranking skinheads strolls up. He's repping SKS or something, which is a white clique of skinheads. He eyeballs me and says, You've got a Jewish tat? I shot back, Yeah, I've got the king of Jews tatted on me. What's up you punk, got a problem? Right then and there, he punked out in front of everyone. He let me straight up call him a punk, basically folded like a cheap suit. I glanced around, thinking, this dude's toast. In prison, especially as a white guy, you cannot let anyone call you a punk. Whether it's a fellow white guy or anyone else joking around, you've got to fire back at them. There's no other option. If you don't, well, like I mentioned earlier, you're getting messed up. That's just how it rolls in the penitentiary. In the end, it was all about manipulation. Some people would manipulate the system to their advantage, even if it meant getting in trouble or putting their lives at risk. It was a dangerous game, and you couldn't trust anyone fully. But while this part of this whole scene was my neighbor, two cells down. They start rounding up all the white guys, and it's strip search time. Now, this guy, he's got a 7-inch blade hanging out of his ass. As they strip us down, he's got it tucked halfway in a plastic bag, the handle barely sticking out. It's a monstrous knife, the kind you'd never believe could fit where it does. You might be thinking, that's some sickening stuff, who shows a 7-inch knife up their ass. But this is the stark reality of prison. You're dealing with people who don't think like you. This dude is ready to do whatever it takes, even if it means using that knife, whether it's on a fellow inmate or a damn cop. So, yeah, he did what he had to do. 
All of this was within a few weeks of being there. Sound sick? Yeah, well then don't end up in prison. Punk. When you first get arrested, you go into a processing sequence of cells called the horseshoe, and basically, this is for new arrestees. You're in these cells for days, and you don't know what day it is. All you can feel is the heat rising and falling, and you're crammed in, like sardines with 40 or 50 people. Fights are breaking out, there's blood on the walls, and guards are rushing in, grabbing people, especially those acting up on drugs. If you really act up, the guards grab you and put you in a restraint chair. It looks like a medieval torture device. They tilt it back, strap you in, and put a hood on your head. There are people out there in chairs just howling and whining. It sounds like something out of a horror film. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Then, you get to see the judge, and I got sent over to medium security in the beginning, which is completely gang and drug infested. So as soon as I get there, some skinhead dudes are eyeing me up. They're like, we want a word with you in that cell back there. You can't say no, because in prison, you don't have much of a choice. They're sizing you up, and you look like their type of recruit. Not because I wanted to, but because I'm white, and in prison, you get affiliated with one of the racial gangs whether you like it or not. It's like that for all races, whites, blacks, Mexicans, Mexican-Americans. I didn't know this yet, but I had to do what they said, so I went into the cell. They ask, what are your charges? And I've got the printout, but it's all in legal speak, so I don't understand it. So I tell them, I've got my charges, but I don't know what they mean. And they freak out, and start pushing me against the wall, shouting. What do you mean you don't know what it means? Are you a chomo? I don't know what a chomo is either so I'm digging my grave here. They've got me up against the wall about to smash me, and I'm making it worse because I don't know how to behave in prison. I tell them to look at my sheet and they take it and look, and they see I've got drug charges. They see my bail is nearly a million dollars, and they love that. They ask me who I killed to get a bail that high. They relaxed and started to joke with me, suddenly they accepted me and let me go. I learned later that Chomo meant you were a child predator. One of the guys who came in with me actually did have those charges. So the next day they ask me about him and I tell them I know nothing. Later I hear someone being beat in the shower area and it's the skinhead gang that questioned me and they leave this guy in there just whimpering in a pool of blood. This big guy says to them as they're leaving, how come we can still hear him? And the head of the skinhead says, we smashed him good. And the big guy says, not good enough. So he goes in and it's like he's trying to crack this guy's head open like a coconut. You can just hear the stomping echoing. Crack. Crunch. The guy looks dead and a guard doing a security walk eventually finds him. He was carried out on a stretcher. He had blood and yellow stuff coming out of his head, like brain fluid or something. It was every day after that, just violence. I had to get used to the sound of heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies being thrown around, people getting carried out on stretchers. They'd wait until the guards did the security walk so that they'd have the most amount of time possible to torture these child predators. One guy, after they were done with him, came out covered in blood. He managed to get down the stairs and knock on the window to the guards, and they opened the door and he just collapsed. There was an old man who wouldn't stop rambling, so the gangs thought they'd shut him up. I walked past him and there was blood splurting out the back of his head. So he was dealt with as far as they were concerned. All of this within a week of being in prison. You had to toughen up fast or you were done for. I've never been to prison, but I did spend a few days in a county jail. It was a community holding area, which meant we all slept together in one room with rows of bunk beds. I'm the quiet, invisible type, 
so I managed to get by pretty well. I sort of befriended a few guys by teaching them chess, playing blindfolded matches, and sharing my food. I didn't eat much during the week I was there. Around day three, a new guy joined our group. He was a short, muscular guy in his 20s, and he had a Napoleon complex written all over him. I did my best to keep my distance, considering I'm a scrawny white guy who didn't know how to defend himself. I had some bad allergies at the time and couldn't stop sneezing. After every single sneeze, even during a series of them, Napoleon would say, Bless you, and I'd respond with a polite, Thank you. It became a repetitive back and forth of, a chew, bless you, thank you. But then, one time, I started sneezing and didn't manage to say thank you after each blessing. That's when things went haywire. Napoleon exploded with anger, charging at me from across the room, yelling obscenities, and raising his fists. My friends from earlier, the ones I taught chess and shared meals with, sprang into action. They rushed over and tackled him before he could reach me. There was a brawl, fists flying, until the guards finally intervened and broke up the fight. Napoleon was promptly sent to isolation. He's lucky that I didn't press charges. I'm here at Burning Man, and I regret every choice that led me here. The heavy rain that swept through the area has turned the place into a muddy nightmare. Thousands of us are now trapped in the middle of nowhere and it feels like literally nobody is trying to help. We've just been told to stay in place, like we have a choice. It's becoming increasingly challenging to stay sane. The entire place is caked in mud, making movement almost impossible. Our campsite is now a soggy patch of dirt. The portable toilets, which were never a delight to begin with, are pretty much impossible to use and people have started using random mud holes as bathrooms. I can't help cringing at the conditions we're enduring. What's even more unsettling than the weather and the lack of sanitary facilities is the behavior of a lot of the men here. This place has always had a problem with boundaries. Implied consent is what comes to mind. Like the kind of implied consent when you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean and you're scared of what might happen if you say no. Unwanted touching, groping, and outright assault seem to be on the rise. It's incredibly disheartening to see how some individuals here struggle to respect personal boundaries. I've lost track of the amount of times I've said I don't like to be touched, but it often falls on deaf ears. Just last night, I was cornered by some weirdo. The other two guys were distracting my male friend who'd been protecting me all night. They were laughing and joking with him and grabbing his attention whilst their friend was pushing me up against the wall and touching me up. Literally two meters away from my man. These same people will call themselves allies but the second they get the chance to take advantage of a vulnerable woman they'll do it. I shouted my friend over the loud music and he finally saw what was going on but it didn't stop the guy from repeatedly pulling my wrist, trying to drag me away. I hate it here and the most recent news is that there's more rain coming. I don't get how we're supposed to survive this. The conditions are terrible. Some people are partying as if nothing is happening and others are having complete meltdowns and acting like it's the apocalypse. The guy who'd been trying to pull me away last night has followed us back and knows where I'm staying now and I'm terrified he's going to suddenly show up in the middle of the night. It's crazy how fast this place went from civilized, peaceful party vibes to seriously hostile. This happened last night around midnight. The first night after the storm. The neon glow and pulsating lights that once lit up the desert have all vanished into the darkness. The wind, charged with moisture from the recent downpour, painfully whistles through the place and feels like a cold slap when it hits you. Most folks have retreated to their camps, seeking refuge from the relentless rain and the now pitch black desert. You can hear the soft patter of raindrops hitting tents and the faint rustle of tarps flapping in the wind. The power's out, and you can't even charge your flashlight. It's like a scene straight out of a post-apocalyptic movie. The only source of light is the occasional flicker of LED lit costumes passing by or someone trying to find their way through the mud with their phone flashlight. 
Someone with a speakerphone kept repeating that we should stay put and secure our stuff, especially anything electrical. The storm had messed up everything, the lights, the music, you name it. Most people just waited in their tents or RVs hoping that the mud would dry or that supplies would make their way to us. Out in the dark, someone stumbled past my tent, muttering something about getting the lights back on. They disappeared toward where the generators were. It's safe to assume that almost everyone you come across here is under the influence of something, so I assumed he was just talking to himself. I heard his wet footsteps fading into the distance, but then I could definitely hear him trying to start the generator. Suddenly there was a scream that echoed through the area. People nearby were shouting and trying to figure out what had happened. The screams were periodic, like he was in a lot of pain and begging for help. We could just hear him screaming repeatedly. Some people came out with flashlights, but even if they could find him, it took minutes to travel just a couple of meters through the thick sludge. It was deep and impossible to walk through without serious effort. Your foot would sink immediately, making it exhausting to get through. Eventually people got to him and I heard a lot of commotion. Apparently he managed to turn the generator on, but was stood in a puddle of water. It doesn't take a genius to know that electricity plus water is a bad combination. We don't even know if he's alive. Multiple people got caught in the electrified water trying to save him. Last I heard is that he was in one of the medical tents, but we've been hearing rumors all day that he died and someone else had a heart attack. I came to Burning Man with a group of friends. They're not the smartest bunch, but they're adventurous and always up for a laugh. After the rain stopped, people were panicking, trying to make a break for it before things got worse. Dozens of people started trying to drive out or walk back to the road. But I don't need to tell you that they didn't get very far. The mud and water ensured nobody got more than a few hundred meters. My friends thought they had a better idea. Instead of joining the frantic crowd heading towards the road, they thought it was smarter to go in the opposite direction, believing it was drier that way. I tried to convince them to follow the official advice. We had an emergency message come through. Do not drive your vehicle. Do not ride your bike. Do not push your bike around. Remain where you are. Secure structures and belongings in your camp. Don't operate generators or other electrically powered instruments that are standing in water. Cover or secure anything electrical. Check on your campmates and neighbors to make sure they're okay and help them as needed. Take advantage of a moment of calm to connect with campmates and hunker down. Stay safe out there, Black Rock City. They didn't want to listen to me about it being a bad idea and thought I was just being soft. But I've been around this kind of mud before. I know how exhausting it is to try to get through it and how dangerous it can be to become dehydrated without shelter in the middle of the desert. They left without me, their map told them it was a three hour walk to the road in the opposite direction. They didn't believe me when I told them that it'd be dark by the time they could even see the road because the mud would easily cut their walking speed in half. I watched them the whole time, slowly trekking through the mud. After about four hours it started to go dark and I could no longer see them. They barely made it halfway to the road and now I could guarantee they couldn't see it. I tried calling them but none of them had any signal. It was cold and they were soaked in mud and likely freezing out there. There's another storm on the way, they're nowhere near the road and I can't get in contact with anyone who can even help. I called the cops and told them about the situation but they said there's nothing they can do until morning anyway, they've already got their hands full. This whole situation is insane. I'm terrified that my friends are out there freezing to death. There's no way they suddenly managed to travel the remainder of the distance in the pitch black. I thought at one point that I saw an orange light in their direction, like a campfire or something, but the visibility here is really bad. I guess it'll be on the news in the next few days if they didn't make it. I can't sleep though. I have a guilty feeling of relief that I didn't go with them but I also feel terrible for not trying harder to convince them.